celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the president tightens the pressure on the Chinese. In response, they put on the gloves again. An unusual alliance in the dairy industry makes sure both partners are in the black. The president's new workforce development program puts workers front and center. And 11-year-old Peyton Bell, a young girl who lights up the ring. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. While NAFTA negotiations continue, everybody hoping for an agreement by December, the volatile boxing match with China is building steam. Those opposed to raising the stakes on both sides of the Pacific making their voices heard. Here's John Torby. Promises were kept this week in the escalating trade war between the world's two largest economies. Earlier this week, President Trump ratcheted up the pressure on China by putting tariffs on an additional $16 billion worth of imported goods. The first set of import duties was launched in early July, with a list of just over 800 items, which added $34 billion to the cost of new products. The Trump administration appears to be in the fight for the long haul as officials are creating a list of tariffs that will add $200 billion to a large catalog of Chinese imports. In reaction, the Chinese Foreign Ministry announced retaliatory tariffs of $60 billion against U.S. imports, including farm commodities and industrial chemicals. Chinese officials label President Trump's recent move as one motivated by a mobster mentality and they claim the tariffs leveled by the U.S. could harm the global economy. The trade war has been fueled by President Trump's accusation that China used unfair business tactics to secure trade secrets from U.S. companies. The new import taxes are expected to go into effect later this month. All of this back and forth has farmers and ranchers worried about lost markets that will be difficult to reclaim. The Trump administration has set aside a one-time assistance fund of $12 billion to help farmers impacted financially by the escalating trade war. The American Farm Bureau Federation is happy the Trump administration is looking out for farmers, but believes the aid package cannot and will not make up for the long-term damage to agricultural exports. From Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. With overproduction and export declines piling up on top of rising production costs, dairy producers fighting a battle for survival. There are federal programs to help make ends meet, but a few producers have chosen a different path. Here's Peter Tubbs. 1,200 Holsteins receive their morning milking at McCarty Farms in Rexford, Kansas. Their milk is high in volume and butterfat compared to other Holsteins in the dairy industry and the path their milk will take to the customer is unusual. We desired a greater connection to the consumer, a greater the connection to the people who bought our milk, uh, and a greater valorization of what we felt were our best practices, uh, in, in the hopes that in doing that, it would create a better economic model. The evolution of the model originally began when the McCarty family moved in 2000 from Pennsylvania to Western Kansas in search of lower feed costs. The pursuit of a different business model led the McCarty's to Dannon, the largest yogurt maker in the United States. We envision a food system that is a little different than it is today, in the sense that we want to be working with Mother Nature and with the dairy farmers to change how food is made. The process of creating a non-GMO feed supply took 18 months and required the McCarty's to convince local farmers to change their seed preferences. For the McCarty's, the increased costs and record keeping were worth the extra work. The partnership between Dannon and the McCarty's is more than just vendor-client. The McCarty's open their books and share their costs of production with Dannon in order to earn what both believe to be a fair price. The relationship between Dannon and McCarty Farms also carries environmental and animal welfare expectations. 
The dairy cows have access to feed and shade and are closely monitored for signs of health issues or a change in milk output. The focus on animal welfare has led McCarty Farms to become the first dairy in the nation to earn all four validus certifications. Animal welfare is something we as a company are very passionate about, uh, the, the health and well-being of, of dairy cows. It's also something that consumers are, are increasingly interested in. It's a process that we put it into the agreements with, uh, with our dairy suppliers because it's that important to us. In the short term, the financial details of the changes Dannon and McCarty Farms have made in their supply chain raise the price of doing business. However, in the long term, being accountable to the customer will be the profitable position in a commodity business. From market to market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Recently, President Trump said Air Force One on course to Midwest battleground states trumpeting a workforce development plan against criticism that trade disputes are hurting American workers and farmers. Once again, here's Don Torpy. Alongside Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, President Trump touted the success of job training programs like the one at Northeast Iowa Community College, where job seekers can learn new skills and find new opportunities in the job market. Whether a citizen's a high school student or a mid to late career worker, we want Americas of, Americans of all ages and backgrounds to be equipped with the skills they need to thrive, preparing American workers for American jobs. We've added 3.7 million jobs since the election. Joining the president were his secretaries of labor and commerce, who both pointed to a lack of skilled workers as an economic deterrent. Education where community colleges respond to what is being demanded by businesses. They teach not just any old skill, but in-demand skills. And that's what this initiative, this Pledge to American Workers, is about. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. So what kind of results did this summer produce in a familiar garden? In this week's edition of Southern Gardening, Gary Bachman takes us back to a home we've seen many times to see this year's version of the landscape. Southern Gardening has been here from the beginning, highlighting producer Tim's mailbox garden. Let's take a look at what he's growing this year. Some of my favorites are the cone flowers in this bed. These tall stems display the two to four inch blooms of bright purple petals and dark center cones. These have been reliable perennials for Tim. I've always loved the bright flowers of Shasta daisies. The bright white petals and the cheery yellow center cones are held high on the ends of 24 to 36 inch stems. A plant that I'm also growing is rockin' deep purple salvia. I love the color contrast between the deep dark purple flowers and black calyx and stems. I'm impressed with the accidental combination of the Indian summer rubecchia and bright redhead and rusty color blaze coleus. Melampodium million gold profusely produces one half inch golden yellow flowers in hot and humid Mississippi. These easy to grow plants make fantastic border plants, especially with the spreading coleus randomly poking out. And to top off the planting, the cranberry crush hardy hibiscus is the perfect accent. The huge seven to eight inch red blooms are stunning. But this year, the garden doesn't stop at the mailbox. In a planter near the house, there's a cascading mass planting of Vista bubblegum and Vista silverberry supertunias. Having a mix of perennials and adding colorful annuals is key to keeping your planting bed looking good year after year. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Some unexpected numbers in a crop report can turn a market upside down. You are not kidding, Mike. We saw that on August 10th with the new crop supply and demand numbers. It was like a bombshell dropping on every soybean field in the country. Also this week, a major player in the chicken business hopes to make some sales at the Golden Arches, while consumer retail demand holds for beef despite competition from pork and poultry. Some likened it to cutting the legs out from under the soybean market, 
bigger production, yield, and ending stock estimates all in one day in one report. Well, that put the soybean trade in a nosedive August 10th. Extension's Josh Maples goes over the big numbers that made for lots of fireworks. You know, we saw ending stocks increase uh, 785 million bushels is, is the new projection. That's up 205 million bushels from this the same number a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the big driver of this is the expected increase in yields. You know, we're looking uh, now the projection 51.6 bushels per acre on soybeans. Now that's up near over three bushels an acre from the same projection a month ago. This has driven total production estimates up near 4.6 billion bushels of soybeans. And you have to think about 51.6 bushels an acre. The record's right around 52, so we're pushing up towards a record, uh, record yield. All of these things put together, we're just going to see a lot of soybeans produced this year, driven mostly by the favorable weather conditions. You know, great, great crop conditions in most of the soybean states. And of course, there's a lot of unknown about the demand for soybeans in the future, and that's kind of a cloud of, added to all these numbers. Yeah, it's really unfortunately a a storm in that we're going to see record production probably or close to record production and uh, at the same time we've got some just concerns on the demand side the trade disputes continue it was interesting in this report we actually saw export projections increase and but the reason for that is because we're at lower prices so you know looking at now uh, countries other than china potentially seeing lower soybean prices coming out of the u.s and uh, thinking that they may import more of our beans. So it was, it was strange to, or, you know, not strange, but it was interesting to see that export number increase. So does the downside increase now or stabilize? Where do you think we go? Although I know nobody knows yeah. exactly. I just don't see a lot of stabilization in this market moving forward. You know, we've got the supply concerns. Uh, as long as, you know, the weather conditions continue to be strong, we're gonna see a large crop. And then you've got the trade concerns as well. And it's just an environment that leads to more uncertainty than it does anything else. So unfortunately, this is this is not a stable market, but it's just really hard to see a lot of a lot of upside potential for prices. Any suggested marketing strategies for producers out there, given the situation? Yeah, I think unfortunately we're in a bit of a wait and see type of environment. You know, obviously the the best the best marketing periods have have already passed for the season. Uh, but there might be some opportunities coming forward, especially if we were to see a weather hiccup somewhere. Um, so just to kind of pay attention to the markets, try to find an opportunity. Soybean trader Tom Fitzenmeyer has an idea of what one opportunity may look like in this shell shock market. When it may materialize for soybeans remains to be seen, but here's his strategy and the numbers to look for. I think, again, you get November beans up in that $9 to nine and a quarter range. If we could possibly do that, then I think you have to, you have to sell, be a seller of new crop. Most farmers are done with old crop selling. There's not a lot of that around. Uh, the, the problem is going to be basis. I, I think the, the basis has just been terrible, and, and I'm, I'm having trouble believing that that's going to... And I know the theory is as prices go down, basis tightens up, mm -hmm. and historically that's kind of the way it works. I guess I'm not sure that's the way it's going to work this year. Time now for a look at today's trivia quiz. We might call it a little history lesson in farm equipment. Here it is for you. What year was the first U.S. four-row cotton picker unveiled? Is the answer A, 1966, B, 1970, C, 1976, or D, 1982? We'll have that answer coming up for you shortly. We'll take a break here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, she is now 11 years old, but you'd never know it. In just a year, 4-H'er Peyton Bell has come far. She's young, but driven, and she's got a bushel of awards that proves she loves what she's doing. And the rest of what they call her goat village is right there too, helping her roll with the punches. The sweet story of a young girl who lights up the ring, coming up later on Farm Week. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before we get to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. 
On Thursday, August 30th, a sweet potato field day at the Pontotoc Experiment Station starting at 8.30 a.m. Topics include herbicide drift, soil fertility, insect and weed management, and more. Sweet potato breeding as well. The event is free. Registration begins at 8 a.m. and there's a steak luncheon. Continuing education credits are available. For more information, call Stephen Myers at 662-769-9917. Next, September is Mississippi Rice Month, recognizing the contribution rice has made to America's economy. On Friday, September 14th from 11 to 1, think rice at the 28th Annual Celebration of Mississippi Rice Month. The luncheon is at Sellers Coliseum at Delta State University. Tickets are five bucks and you can buy them by calling the Bolivar County Extension Office at 662-843-8371. Tickets are also will be available at the door. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Chicken processor Tyson Foods is hoping an upcoming big buy will open the door to the Golden Arches. Tyson Foods is on the verge of purchasing chicken nugget maker Keystone Foods. Bloomberg News reports that Keystone is a supplier of chicken nuggets to McDonald's. Tyson is hoping that acquisition will give its company an opportunity to sell its chicken to the big fast food chain. Well, despite competition from chicken processors as well as the pork sector, the live cattle market is described by some traders as good and steady this summer. Analyst Elaine Cub has some thoughts now about what's going on there. The live cattle market is strong because when those supplies do get offered to the packers, they want to make their $300 per head. This is one market where exports are not bad news. We do not have terrible disasters in beef exports. So I think the, the line for beef, for live cattle anyway, is just good steady strength. Things aren't so good for the pork business in China these days. Farmers' profits there are being pinched by Beijing's decision to levy a 25% retaliatory tariff on U.S. soybeans. Soybean meal makes up about 20% of the typical hog feed used in China. The South China Morning Post reports that it's costing the average producer there in China about $5.30 more to raise each hog because of the tariff on beans. And a new line of tires from Goodyear feature a soybean-based rubber compound. The research that developed the Assurance Weather Ready Tires was made possible by the soy checkoff. The soy-based compound reportedly remains soft at lower temperatures, making for enhanced traction in dry, wet, and winter weather conditions. Well, back to trivia now to conclude this week's markets. Today's question, it involved a little machinery history for you. Let's see how you did with the answer. What year was the first U.S. four-row cotton picker unveiled? Well, the Delta Farm Press reports the answer is B, 1970. It was a John Deere model. No question, 4-H is a time of happy memories for many of our country's kids. For one young lady, though, it's also been a time of extraordinary growth. From one of the many extensions in the U.S., this one at Mississippi State University, here's a special story of just why extension matters. Peyton Bell is outstanding. She's dedicated, she's hardworking, and she just has the brightest personality. That's what the judges always comment about her. They was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't see you until you smiled. And she, once she smiled, she, she has your attention. Everybody at the show to love her and they cheer for her. And, and when she win, everybody uh, cheering. So we're very, very proud of her. I enjoy seeing these kids grow into this and getting at the front of that line. It takes initiative. You have to want it. And she's wanted it from day one. They ask me what do I do. I tell them that I was showing goats. And most people think I roped them, but I tell them that I groomed them and walked them and positioned them and I enjoy being their friends. I raise and show dairy goats, and whenever I met them, they were ready to raise and show dairy goats. Peyton's grandfather come to me and talked to me about getting his granddaughter into agriculture, and I told him that, let's do it. 
You know, it's nothing to it but to do it. And she's done really well with that. Once I bought the goat, her and her dad decided they wanted to show the goat. And I said, show the goat? I said, I, I don't know. She said, well, I, I'd like to show him, granddaddy. I said, well, okay. We'll see about it. And of course, we went to the, the 4-H people and found out that they do show goats. And then we always have to know all the parts to the goat, from the muzzle to the tail. As of getting with Miss Deidre, and Miss Deidre worked with her on showing and, and the procedure and methods of showing. My granddaughter, she's she very sharp. She, she learned very, very well. And uh, we try to teach her the right way and try to teach her to do it the right way every time. Now you want to put this front leg straight down, make it straight down. Miss Deidre, she showed me how to clip them. She showed me how to wash them. She showed me how to maneuver them around us. That's right. Give me a high five. That's good. When I prepare the goats for the shows, I have to make sure that they stay fed. But it doesn't matter how big their stomachs are. It depends on their udder. So they have to have enough milk in their udder. That's how they mostly win. And then I also walk them around so they don't know how it feels to walk around the pen. And I also have to keep them brushed and washed. I always go upwards. And then once you go upwards, then brush. Upwards, brush, upwards, brush. From the very first show that she ever did, she placed second in showmanship in a matter of five minutes of her doing it, you know, from the very first time. And of course, a lot of that came from prepping with Deidre and her daughter, Tori. And um, we had some of the extension personnel come down and do, you know, just, just teaching and, you know, helping them to learn in the process. And it, it, it all paid off. Parents can't do it for them. When they're out in that show ring, it's that kid, that goat, and that judge, and it's up to them. And they have to know all the parts, That's right. all the breeds. I mean, it's a lot of things that they have got to know to get that first place position. But whenever you're eight or nine years old and you get this first place for showmanship, showmanship is seeing how good you do. Not how you do. you know how many total you have? No, I don't. It's a bunch. Yeah. I know I have three big ribbons in a plate in the middle. On my first show, I got second place in showmanship. So it felt good to see how when you put your best effort forward, then you'll win something in return. From the very beginning, she kind of just grabbed onto it and ran with it. So from there, it's kind of where we are now. <laughs> we have Alpine, we have Taco Burger, we have St. Nice, we have a variety of them now. You know more about goats than you ever thought that you would. More than I ever wanted to know. I, I know way more than I need to know about goats at this point. <laughs> so at every single event, whether it's a clinic or it's a show, her family supports her 100%. They're cheering her on, they're holding her animals, they're helping her clean her animals, feed, water, whatever it is Peyton needs, they're there to support her for that. Everybody that you see here now, and it's usually my mom and dad as well, and then sometimes her uncle will come. It actually is, we have this many people everywhere we go. We really do. It is a family affair. We have, we're her little goat village. <laughs> it means a lot to me that they support me. Because most of my family supports me no matter what, even if it was goats or anything. So that makes me feel good to know that they care. I wholeheartedly appreciate the 4-H, the extension program, the whole process because she's pretty much growing up before my eyes every day. So I live for it. I, I, I always want to see her smile. And then she's really, really, really independent and she learns and does things a lot on her own. What would you say the one characteristic maybe that has improved in you through this? I mean, there's a lot of things. Responsibility. I value the extension in the livestock program because our kids need direction. Our kids need values. I mean, you can't go wrong whenever you're teaching them work and responsibility. And I mean, that's, that's what life is all about. The greatest aspect about the livestock project is 
we're not just creating kids that can go out there and show an animal in the ring. We're creating leaders, kids that can be successful and create a really bright future. It's just a very proud moment. She's going to go somewhere. She's going to be somebody. Great story, persistent young lady, isn't she? That's right, Mike, and of course a real example of how 4-H really works for young people. Yeah. Well, next week on Farm Week, consumer demand for local fresh produce continues to grow in the Mid-South as well as nationwide, and so does the interest in sustainable agriculture, maintaining that ecological balance without depleting natural resources. One group has evolved to support and expand this movement, the Alliance of Sustainable Farms. That's next time on Farm Week. Before we ride off into the sunset, a quick story. Cows working <laughs> in law enforcement. You probably saw this all over Facebook and Twitter in Sanford, Florida, north of Orlando. A couple of crooks stole a car tag, put it on their car. They were spotted by police who gave chase. After losing control of the car, one of the crooks ran off into a field nearby full of cows. The cows gave chase and herded one of the bad guys right into the waiting handcuffs of the Sanford Police Department. One officer there told me they had never seen anything quite like this before. <laughs> well, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching.